everybody, and welcome to Attendance Bias. I am your host, Brian Weinstein. Today's episode follows the format of the older mini-episodes of Attendance Bias. For you new listeners out there, this means that today's episode is shorter than usual, and there is no guest. That means that I'm telling a story about a show that I've been to and a jam that I've witnessed. Today's episode focuses on Fish's performance of Drowned from December 12th, 1999 at the Hartford Civic Center. This show in Hartford was my seventh show. Leading up to it, I had a pretty good run seeing phenomenal Fish performances all in the New York City area between Long Island and Madison Square Garden. To sum it up, I was still in the honeymoon phase of my Fish fandom, and based on the tapes that I listened to from the summer of 1999, I assumed that everything the band touched turned into gold immediately. Plus, I saw two shows at the Nassau Coliseum in October 99 that blew me away. At this point, by December 99, my friends and I had all recently got our driver's licenses, so our next natural step was to travel outside of our comfort zone to see fish. Now, we all have our honeymoon periods with fish. Every one of us, every fan has that era when we think fish is untouchable and that they are infallible. It naturally follows that we all have a loss of innocence. We all have that first show where the band doesn't excite us. We all have that first show when it's really hard to get there or to get tickets. We all have that first show when we realize those four guys up there are humans like the rest of us, and sometimes they have a really hard day at work. For me, that show is December 12th, 1999 at the Hartford Civic Center. I have strong memories of the show, even if they're not all great memories, but the second set opened with a half hour long drowned, and in addition to all the stuff that I don't love about this show, that one, that performance of drowned really sticks out to me. And more than that, it went to show that even when the band doesn't fully deliver, there's always something that's memorable. So let's hear about my experience with drowned from December 12th, 1999 at the Hartford Civic Center. After two shows at the Nassau Coliseum in October of 1999, there was a much larger adventure that awaited me and my friends. After a short month of planning, we were set to go see fish at our first shows outside of New York State. When we looked over the tour dates, we settled on Hartford on December 12, 1999. Why we didn't decide to go to Philadelphia for what has since been regarded as one of the best shows of 1999, I'll never ever know. But Hartford it was. And it was this show that taught me a valuable lesson in the world of fish. No matter how much you pay, no matter how far you travel, no matter what you go through to get there, fish doesn't owe you anything. In the winter of 1999, my friends and I were all high school juniors. We were all 17 years old and we were getting our driver's licenses. My friend Mike was given permission to borrow his parents' car for this Hartford show. We got our tickets... But roughly 48 hours before we were due to leave, Mike's parents had a sudden change of heart. They told him that he was too new, he was too young, he was too inexperienced to drive himself and three of his friends to Hartford from Long Island. Now that I'm 38 years old, I can look back and I totally agree with them. At the time, Mike had his license for maybe six months, and we weren't exactly experts with directions or highway driving, because remember, this was before Google Maps, before MapQuest, before Waze, anything. But at the time, I flipped out. This was putting a death knell in what I considered to be unalterable plans. They were set in stone, even though we only made them a month before. But more to the point, it was from all the tapes I listened to, all of the books I read, all of the discussion I had with other fans, it was intrinsic to the fish experience to travel for shows. There's a joy in hometown shows, but traveling with your buddies to a new destination is an adventure, and I hadn't had that opportunity yet. All of that excitement that was built over the past month was kiboshed with one phone call. Like I said, I get it now but I'm sure my self-righteous, entitled 17-year-old mouth had some pretty awful things to say about Mike's parents at the time. They were just two loving people who were making the best decision for their kid and his friends, but I just wanted to see fish. I wanted to see fish at any opportunity I could, and my head was still very romantic about the idea of traveling to see them. So after some shaming and begging and angry back and forth, we procured Amtrak tickets from Penn Station to Hartford. 
The train would get us in really close to the start time of the show. We had no idea where the train station was in relation to the venue. We would have to split up for two of us to stop at the hotel to check in, and then two of us would head to the show. Now, this would be no big deal. But back then, remember, there were no cell phones. This sort of travel and racing against the clock for fish was brand new to me, and it was terrifying. What if we missed the show? What if we got lost? What if we got off the train and it was 10 miles from the hotel? There was too much unknown and it frightened the hell out of us. We got to the venue right at the razor's edge of the show's start time. We split up. Two of us got the tickets, checked into the hotel again, and we got to the venue about 15 minutes before show time. I remember the scene outside was very loud. It was very raucous and it was cold. What we would later find out is that earlier in the year, the Dave Matthews Band played at the Hartford Civic Center, and at that show, there was a massive riot, and there was fighting between the drunken fans and cops. For Fish, the city of Hartford wasn't taking any chances, and it brought out riot police to stand at the perimeter of the venue. This armed presence definitely caused tension. I can remember it, and I could feel it right now. To my memory... There were no actual issues or there were no violent episodes outside the venue, but fans were definitely on edge getting inside. The extra security caused a longer than usual wait to enter, and once we scanned our tickets, we ran right to our seats. We sat down just as the lights went down, thrilled to have finally made it after trials and tribulations. All of our difficulties and obstacles overcome, lights went down, the band comes on, and... They opened with heavy things. Back in 1999, when fans were still getting used to Farmhouse and its songs, heavy things, I even remember now, it was kind of the persona non grata. It was the album's single at the time, it was played five months later on David Letterman's show, and it barely varied from performance to performance. When they opened with it on December 12th, the crowd's excitement and energy It died down within 15 seconds of the song's beginning. If you go on fish.in, you could listen to the first set of this show. You'll hear how the music doesn't build any excitement or momentum. I remember being profoundly disappointed. I was still pretty early on in my fandom. It had been about two years since I'd seen the band, but it was only a couple shows in. So I thought that every show was awesome all the time. I thought that every show was a masterpiece. I was still in my honeymoon period. But in this case, the first set was a letdown, aside from Chalk Dust Torture, which delivered its characteristic charge, until at the very end, Trey explained that his grandfather had died the night before, which was of course heartfelt, but from an audience standpoint, the crowd wasn't sure how to react. Do we cheer? We didn't know. During set break, my friends and I kind of made polite chatter, but... It was kind of awkward between us. None of us really wanted to admit that maybe the first set didn't deliver what we wanted. At the time, we were too proud. But soon the lights went down for the second set, and it opened with a 31-minute version of Drowned. I went crazy for the novelty of hearing the song for the first time. I'm such a big Who fan, and I was drawn in by this mesmerizing jam, this half-hour-long performance that at the time probably was the longest continual song I'd ever heard live. It would also prove that even when Fish owes you nothing, they can still deliver big time. The jam for Drown starts with lots of purpose and straight rock and roll. Trey and Paige lead the way with some very big soaring leads that, to me, they're more reminiscent of the summer of 1999 as opposed to the more ambient fall 99 and, of course, December 99. This was the sort of drive that was missing in the first set.
And just a couple of minutes later, the whole jam reaches its big energetic zenith. Trey triggers his wah-wah pedal and Mike dances on the high end of the bass. Fishman is doing his best Keith Moon impression. Everything came together. For my taste, this segment was the peak of the jam and the whole show before things settled down for a weird 25-minute jam. Around 11 minutes in, the band moves into a groove that lasts for nearly three full minutes. You can hear Fishman toying with the idea of switching to half speed, but he decides not to, and he keeps going at full throttle, energizing the band to keep up. I still can't get over how fast Fishman was playing for so long. They've been riding this wave since the song began, and they showed no signs of letting up over 10 minutes in. At this point, it's really developing into something special. When a previous guest of attendance bias, Joseph Rosenberg, came on to talk about the previous night in Philadelphia, he said you could hear the band's music preparing for Big Cypress all the way through this tour, and this segment is what I think he meant. About halfway through the jam, the band developed a sort of call and response between Trey Mike Page and then Fishman. The three guys up front are playing in a more staccato sense. They give space for Fishman to keep the beat with a really tight fill that keeps it all together. It's stuff like this that even if you're at a show where the whole thing feels a bit disappointing, like to me this one did, you walk out having seen and heard something you've never seen or heard before. It's a cliche but this is the stuff that makes me keep coming back.
And then toward the end, by around 20 minutes, things finally take a little bit of a break. They hit a valley and just explore for a little bit. It's really very funny how our memories work. When I was listening back to this, I hear it now completely different than when I experienced it at the time. In my head, this version of Drowned was 30 minutes of ethereal, ambient exploration. But listening back in 2021, two-thirds of it is straight-ahead psychedelic rock and roll. It's not quite party music, but it's more upbeat than I have in my memory. The Fish.net Jam Chart describes it as, quote, solid, not epic, and worth checking out. And I have to disagree with the first part. This is an epic listen. It may be on par with the version from September 14th, 2000 from Darien Lake. When the band keeps this soft, steady, but fast groove going, Trey pushes in these weird, abstract noises that I now frequently associate with late 1.0, especially 2000, and also the early part of 2.0 in 2003. Now I can look back and hear it as kind of a precursor to waves from it. It kind of shares that flavor and other strange jams. But at the time, in 1999, when I was 17 and ready to just have energy and electricity pulsate through me after spending a long time on the train and going through so much stress before the show, it probably bored me. I was wondering when they would get back to that part of the jam that I loved earlier. It's amazing how age and experience can change your perspective on music that hasn't changed for over two decades since it's been played. The music stays the same. But your ears, your understanding, and your perspective can completely flip upside down. And then all of a sudden, we're at a half hour later. By the end of the jam, we've left all sense of drowned. This is like beyond type two, and it's almost into type three, and even farther out. It takes a very particular type of music fan to keep track of all of this over the course of a half hour. And I'm sorry to say that my 17-year-old self probably wasn't game. But now, like I said earlier, I can appreciate it much more as a proper landing spot for a mammoth jam. And I can enjoy it from time to time, even though it's really weird, supremely weird, and angular.
By the end, as Drown softly landed to a stop, the elephant tranquilizer in the room returned. The set moved on with Prince Caspian, the squirming coil, Makasupa Policeman, and Run Like an Antelope. Now, don't get me wrong, they're all fine songs, and taken piece by piece, I love every one of them. I would never skip over them. And Makasupa even added some much-needed levity, as Trey said that he had an herbal jazz cigarette. But there was nothing throughout this set after Drowned in the way of exuberance or purpose. Run Like an Antelope did cap things nicely and left the audience on a high note, but for me it was kind of too little too late. A standard Runaway Jim encore was apropos by the numbers performance. And this was the first time I walked out knowing that I witnessed a less than stellar show. Aside from Drowned, there was nothing compelling about it. The fact that we had gone through what we considered at the time to be a major hassle just to make it to the venue only rubbed salt in the wound. And this is where I learned. No matter what, Fish does what they do. Sometimes it's great, sometimes it's average, sometimes it's life-changing, and rarely, but sometimes, it is a disappointment. In the 22 years since this show, I've learned this lesson over and over again. And I'm much more mellow these days about the whole thing, and actually Coventry helped a lot in that regard. But back in 99, I really wasn't ready for it. I was such an enthusiastic new fan that I was entitled. I expected every show to shoot me into these reaches of the universe with unbridled joy. This show brought me back down to earth. And that's it for today's episode of Attendance Bias about Drowned from December 12th, 1999 at the Hartford Civic Center. I'd like to thank Fish.net, as always, for providing all of the information that I needed today, and Fish.in for a very solid recording that was used for today's episode. If you enjoy Attendance Bias, please support the show by leaving a rating and a review on your favorite podcast app. That is the best way by far to support this show. Thanks so much for doing that. You could also reach out to me on social media, most frequently on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Say hi, and I'll send you a free sticker. Thank you again so much for listening, and I'll see you next week on Attendance Bias. Bye.